The first congressional district Democratic primary features 11 candidates. All of them were on this stage in this last week in the Granite State debates. And here to unpack that race and the second congressional district race are Casey McDermott of the New Hampshire Public Radio and Kevin Landrigan of the New Hampshire Union Leader. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Casey, uh, let's first go to you here. Uh, I'm interested for your perspective on that first congressional district Democratic debate. You were lucky enough to be able to watch this on TV, which is what the voters are seeing. What were some of the takeaways there for you? So I think it's interesting that if I were a voter who was coming to this debate for the first time, I don't think there was a real front runner on that stage. So I think it makes it even more of a free for all going into Tuesday. I think one of the things that really stood out to me as someone who has been following the race as a little bit more of an insider maybe is that you had the kind of middle of the pack candidates maybe who elevated themselves and were able to stand out a little bit more. Maybe people like Terrence O'Rourke or Naomi Andrews or um, you know Mindy Mesmer, some of them who may not have been seen as front runners in the way that I think Chris Pappas or perhaps Maura Sullivan were, that were able to nonetheless kind of come away from that debate saying, okay, I might have gotten a few more votes from that. But it's really actually kind of astonishing that 11 people could be on stage and all of them seemed like mostly credible mm -hmm. candidates. So let's talk about a key moment that unfolded in this debate and generated a lot of conversation afterwards. We asked all of the candidates who they voted for in that bitterly divisive 2016 presidential primary between Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. Maura Sullivan's answer raised some eyebrows. Another question to wrap up this lightning round. In the 2016 primary, did you vote for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders? This might be an easy one for you, Mr. Sanders. I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> Bernard Sanders. Ms. Sullivan. Um, I supported the Democratic nominee in the general election. There was an audible ooh in the room when she said that, but we learned some subsequent things about why she had to answer that way. What was it? We did. Well, for one thing, she was in Washington, D.C., working at the Pentagon at that time during the 2016 primary campaign. D.C. had the last presidential primary in June of 2016. Hillary Clinton got 78 percent of the vote in that primary. The race was over by then. So it's kind of understandable um, she didn't actually take part in that election. We continue to kind of look at her voting patterns in other years at the union leader as well. So uh, keep watching for that. But, but that's what that's just the ultimate kind of mistake that a first-time candidate makes. Even a first-time candidate who's polished, who's got a lot of money behind her. I mean, the metaphor is the deer in the median always becomes roadkill. She tried to be, she tried to straddle, straddle both sides. And you talk about those viewers. The viewers who support Bernie Sanders assume she was with Hillary. The people who support Hillary assume she was with Bernie. So you lose with both camps. So what do you think is more important? A little gaffe like this, and then there's also the back and forth that we have between uh, the Pappas campaign and the Sullivan campaign about that negative mailer, or uh, that sort of rumbling steamroller of the constant television ads that Morris Sullivan has going right now, Casey? That's a tough call, because I think those ads, you know, we can't discount the impact that they may have made in terms of just painting a, a favorable portrait of a, you know, a female veteran, which is a very, I think, you know, it's a good bio to have coming into particularly, I think, a Democratic race, because if you're a Democratic primary voter, you may be looking, that and, looking at that and saying, okay, this is someone who may even have a little bit more cred with independence once we get around to the general election. That being said, I think that some of the kind of negativity that spawned from the mailers that you mentioned, as well as maybe some of the skepticism that came from that question could end up, you know, harming harming her as well. Yeah. But she's like the elephant in the room in that debate, right? I mean, she's got almost $2 million on her side. She's almost got six, $700,000 in outside groups spending on MUR and, and, and other media with advertising, that's what surprised me most about this debate. If I'm Chris Pappas and I'm the establishment candidate, I'm the perceived front runner, I've got to take her on in that debate. And I've got to challenge her. And he had there were opportunities where he could have challenged why are you why are you calling me spineless on health care? I led on health care, whether it was Medicaid expansion or whatever, and force force this race to on on camera to be a two person race because you Casey's right, it never materialized. Certainly, and if there are woman voters out there who want yes. a woman candidate, there were only three on the stage, and Sullivan certainly seemed to be the most forceful. 
I would say that, but I also think that, you know, Naomi Andrews was, I think, a dark horse a little bit in the in the debate, and not least of all because of that question that you asked, you know, who would you make your chief of staff? She was the clear right. front runner. That was a good moment um, for her. So, you know, she stands out as someone who has experience and credibility as well. Um, I think Mindy Mesmer, certainly, I don't think we can underestimate the importance of some of the water issues and the kind of environmental issues that she's really taken up um, as the mantle in her campaign, especially in this district. So yeah. I think it's really up for grabs. Right. And it yeah. seems like this this vote is going to be chopped up, uh, obviously, 11 ways. Uh, but certainly there's a lane for a lot of different people. And I want to ask you, Kevin, you've been covering yeah. these races a long time. Sure. Uh, could we see another uh, Carol Shea Porter style upset somehow like we did 12 years ago? Well, certainly, I mean, even Morris Sullivan winning this race would be a mild upset. And I, cert and I think that's possible. I don't think it's likely that... We're going to see a mega surprise like we did with Carol Shea Porter. I do think, and it, we saw it in this debate, I think somebody is going to overperform on Tuesday. And maybe a couple of candidates would overperform. I'd point to Mindy Mesmer. I think she's going to do extremely well. She could be even finish as high as third in this race. Deglin McEachern is another candidate who has impressed a lot of activists and has really worked hard. And, and know me... Naomi Andrews, that's, what, that's the imponderable in this race to me is she's got the Shea Porter organization. She's got the endorsement. What's it really worth in 2018? That's a fascinating question. Right. And we could talk about this for hours probably. <laughs> we do have to cover the 2nd Congressional District Republicans. Uh, let's roll a clip here. Uh, there was a nice little exchange uh, that we, ha we hadn't had many of those in the last week, but we got a nice little exchange between Steve Negron and Stuart Levinson on the issue of veterans health care. Um, Dr. Levinson put out that the very number one reason to vote for him into Congress is that he took on Washington and won. Um, I don't think anybody's won. You know, if you look at the Secretary of the VA, just in the end of July, we have 400,000 backlogs. When Secretary Shulkin uh, got notice of what we were doing as whistleblowers, he came with $30 million in new funding. He removed some bad leadership. Measures in New Hampshire went up. They're still improving. Clearly, a lot more needs to be done. The problem is Ann Custer. Casey, what did that exchange tell us about how... Steve Negron sees this race right now. I think it tells us that he sees Levinson as the front runner and he wants to chip away at whatever lead he might have. Um, and I think that there's probably some some credibility to that. You know, Levinson has really, I think, been on the air more than any candidate in terms of television ads, introducing himself, which in, you know, again, in a race where there are so many candidates, it might not be 11 like the Democratic uh, in the first district, but there's still a fair number of them and they have to do anything they can to kind of differentiate themselves and introduce themselves. Um, and what we saw Negrin trying to do on stage was differentiate himself with, um, you know, someone else on that stage who was trying to tout experience working with veterans, being, you know, in that environment. And um, that was, I think, what Negrin was trying to do. And Steve Negron, Kevin, has won all of these straw polls. Yes. But uh, he clearly sees Levinson as someone he needed to attack. He does. And I thought for a first time, Kennedy. Levinson handled himself pretty well to that challenge. First, in response to Casey's question about why didn't you act sooner than you did act, and he basically said, I tried to work within the system as long as I thought the system was on our side. And then when Negrin attacks him, he doesn't attack in kind. He basically says, you know, clearly more work needs to be done, and then turns it to Custer. It's all about Andy Custer. I felt Levinson was one of the only candidates on that stage throughout the debate was trying to turn it to Custer because after all she's she's the woolly mammoth I mean she's got three million dollars in a, sitting in a bank account now and has only just started to advertise on television so the Republican nominee is going to start way behind on Tuesday whoever that person is and they've got to make this a negative campaign against Custer right. to have any traction. In an interesting tactic we saw from Bob Burns in his closing statement, we need the deplorables to come out, <laughs> directly appealing to the Trump voters. Do the deplorables come out, do you think, in CD2? I mean, I think they could. I think that I was surprised in 2016 at how well um, the Republican nominee that year did against Custer. I think that, you know, there's there's been no shortage of kind of unpredictable races thus far this year. And I think that we could see, you know, maybe perhaps an even redder one this year, depending on how things go between now and November. What do you think, Kevin? I was just going to say, go back to Bill Gardner's prediction at, at week's end on Friday. He sees 90,000 Republicans turn out. That would be the lowest in the last five elections. That would be the lowest primary turnout of Republicans. Now, if he's right, I think it, I think the Trump vote is going to be disproportionately large 
um, in that primary. And so um, a candidate like, if Burns had some money behind him, he's articulate. I thought he had a very good night on Friday, um, but I just don't think he has enough horsepower to get there on right. Tuesday. And certainly deplorables meant with all due respect to our <laughs> viewers there as well. Kevin, Casey, thank you so much for your insight yep. and great job on the panel tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.